Hey everyone. Hi everyone. It's December. Ooh, the month of winter solstice. Yeah, and also we won't go through the list. You know the list of what we are all bearing up under. Those of us who have the time and attention to create this update and to look at it. Um, this is just part of, of our medicine, part of how we support each other and ourselves in what historically will probably be reflected as pretty dark times. I love the origin of the word solstice. We've got the Latin soul for sun and then the Latin stare for to stand still. And that refers to the fact that on the solstice, and really a couple days before and a couple days after, at noon, the sun seems to rest on the same line on the horizon without any movement up or down. It stands still. And that sort of pause is a, is a threshold, a bridge from one place to the next. The, well, talk more about that. Um... Because it feels, I don't know how it's feeling to you all, but it feels to me like we've had a really long pause here. <laughs> and that we had some sunshine, or we had some light uh, for a lot of it as we passed through the summer solstice. But now we really are in the dark days, and we've come into a time when COVID is just taking off even more, as we were warned. Um, and, you know, Gary and I, and, and you as well, are well aware that this is just, we're on the front porch of, of climate change and, and the things that we can't really anticipate that are going to be different and challenging. We've seen some of it with the wildfires um, and, and with the floods and with the hurricanes, oh my goodness. So I'm, I'm kind of, you know, as I reel that stuff off, this is the stuff that can make for it feeling very, very, dark what else from the natural world about well, darkness not just to counterbalance but so we know so something else that occurs to me um the chinese uh, ancient chinese who were very prone to taking cues from the natural world to kind of inform their philosophies and their their general wisdom said that the winter solstice is the change from yin energy to yang energy. So things will begin after the solstice according to their view of the world and the natural world as a whole begin slowly, 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 but surely uh, coming back around again to a, a greater state of animation, a greater state of life. So you said what's going on in the natural world right now? Well, where we are in the northern latitudes, things have slowed down uh, to the extent of Oh gosh, you might have a frog just absolutely laying on the mud on the bottom of a pond doing the Zen thing for many, many months now, lowering his or her uh, respiration, uh, the, the rate at which, by that I mean the rate at which oxygen is exchanged and cellular activity is, is conducted. We've got roots that have, if they're above the freezing line, they've kind of jettisoned their excess water so they don't freeze like a like a burst pipe in a house. Um, we've got other critters that are actually trading out the normal fluids in their every one of their cells for a high glucose mix, which is like antifreeze to help them um, make it through the winter. So lots of different strategies, but in general, I think things are, are slowed down. You know, the advantage though of, of the cold part of winter is that it really has a big effect on limiting the spread of pathogens and destructive forest insects like pine bark beetles out here in the west or deer ticks across the country. So that cold is directly responsible, for instance, for how fast and how severe Lyme disease um, and West Nile virus uh, may spread in, in the human community. So again, we're coming back to that theme that we're all tied together. So that cold and dark may not be the favorite time of year, but it, it is, um, part of the cycle that the whole world has, uh, at least in the northern latitudes, adjusted to. Well, and I said all, the whole planet. Yeah, 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 That's, and certainly when it comes to the dark light cycle. Right, yeah, right, absolutely. and high summer in Australia right now. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, this is one of the things with full ecology as it keeps developing in our understanding is, so what, how can we turn to the natural world 
in times that not just seem, are so dark. They're dark outside because of the angle of the sun for us in the northern hemisphere. Um, and, and they feel dark, metaphorically. Uh, what is the deal about darkness and humans? And, and that's, I think, uh, a, not a bad question to spend some time up next to. What, so what's the deal with darkness? Part of what we know, I know personally, and you can check for yourselves, is uh, darkness makes uncertainty a lot more present, as if it's not always present. Uncertainty, and really it's, uh, it's expression in the fact that these lives will end in death. And, you know, so this is, this is certainly what COVID shows us. And it's a lot of what the other unrest threatens. Can we humans pause long enough to allow regeneration? Can we stop in our panicked attempts to fix everything, to slow down, and we've been asked to isolate, to stay in that sometimes dark space of patience, and then there, what comes forward? And you're saying that in the actual darkness right now, there's several things going on. One is the pause. Mm -hmm. a, sl a slowing. And one is a kind of regeneration that with, without which the budding and flowering some of it's pretty busy down there underground. Isn't yeah, it? that's a good point. I'm glad you mentioned that because underneath the, the so-called frost line, there are microorganisms just doing their thing, happy as, as can be at breaking down pieces of rock, if you will, and making nutrients available to what will become uh, plants in the spring and flowers. And then, of course, the, the animals will eat the plants and, and that life cycle will start up again. So there's a lot of activity going on underground, out of sight. And I think that may be worth um, contemplating. Furthermore, that's kind of comforting. You know, yeah. the world is continuing. We, with our self-consciousness, with our capacity to reflect on, on ourselves as beings, our experience of being separate from one another, and, unfortunately, our awareness that we will die gets us a little uh, off balance. Too, pretty easily. Too easily? Apparently not. That's what one of the things that humans do. Um, all the while, no matter how dark and cold, the natural world is taking care of itself. So this is a worthy investigation too, just to check. May make you feel better, may not. But we know from uh, neuroscience, and any of us can probe into that further, that our nerves continue to myelinate, that they continue to migrate and make new nerves throughout the life cycle, as it turns out. That in the darkness of this form, there is regeneration occurring all the time. There's sloughing off and dying occurring all the time. This is the natural world at work in this form that's going on outside always too. A tree doesn't have self-consciousness. So a tree participates in the dance between life and death as long as it exists and isn't fussed by it because it doesn't have this self-awareness. So we get this extra kind of challenge. What does it mean to show up in presence? Not what does it mean, what does it look like? To show up in presence with one another, day after day, in isolation, um, particularly people who live by themselves. How do you show up to yourself? How do you reach out to other people through these avenues that we have? Um, how do we take care of each other in the darkness? Each of those things, arguably, is energy and could be seen and understood as light. So, you know, I've heard it said that um, there is a great deal to be gained from paying attention to what you resist. And we do resist darkness. So what does the darkness this year, and this time especially, in the circumstances that we're facing together and by ourselves, what does that have to teach us? We can 
you know, just throw up our arms and say, this is so frustrating, I'm not, I don't want to be patient anymore. And that's certainly an option. So we're not saying that this is for everybody to do this quiet contemplation. But if you get tired of throwing up your arms, maybe it's something that you'd want to just check and see, is there anything here for me? And, you know, I do want to add to that. Take care of yourselves. If you keep coming up empty, is there anything here for me? Make sure to be in touch with other people. Tell the truth and tell other people the truth. Because these are times we can, when it's really possible to mistake this seeming wasteland of experience for the end of our lives, or no more reason to exist. Well, this is a time when <coughs> across cultures around the world, people come together. This is the beginning of the storytelling season for a lot of indigenous cultures. It's a time of ritual and celebration where people come together, um, I think in part reaction to the fact that we, we, we need each other, mm -hmm. perhaps especially when it's dark and when it's cold. One last interesting thing to me anyway, and some small shred of comfort, if you look at, especially in the northern latitudes, the birth of, uh, in mythologies of, of baby gods and baby goddesses almost always happens around winter solstice. Mm -hmm. um, that's the time of year when these uh, beings of hope and often identified with light uh, come into the world, so much so that in parts of Northern Europe, uh, in Norway and parts of Scandinavia, um, winter solstice is still referred to as Mother's Night, the Mother's Night. Uh, from that history of imagining something being born that will provide the, the light that we, we seek. Um, not to get us totally out of the present moment dealing with the dark that is right now, but there is a kind of hope and a kind of trust that things will turn, that the wheels will turn. Well, truly, that's part of the darkness of the present moment. Yeah. It's just to be, uh, make ourselves right. available to what birthing is happening and might go unnoticed otherwise. Yeah. You know, what is coming forward? Um, we're really being invited into that. There's a couple of, of practical things that, that you can consider because needless to say, this is not a good time for us to be gathering in large groups. It's, it's not a good idea. Um, and it's mostly not happening. Um, so what do we do? Well, we have learned that unlike Zoom meetings, where there are a lot of faces and people are ostensibly and sometimes really on task um, and how wearing those can be. The smaller Zoom social connections, like we've had really surprising connections with friends of ours who are across the country um, that have been quite comforting just to spend some time over coffee. Um, so that's a way of reaching out. So that's one concrete suggestion to use the technology we have, but do it in, in a more um, fr friendship uh, supportive and, and in the way, in the spirit of the season, the way yeah. that we reach out. Right. A second one is really to take a look at stories, to, to look uh, even on Google for myths and just pick one at random and read it and see about these stories that tend to come forward at this time of year across the experience of verbal human beings. I, I, I'm mixing the two things you said, uh, connect with your friends and your family and, and your dearest stories. ones and, and tell stories nice. from your life and ask um, the other people who are present to about their lives. Uh, and um, I think there's some some hope and some healing and some respite from, uh, you know, the anxiety that can sometimes wiggle its way into our brains in the, in the dark. Uh, another um, concrete thing that we've heard of recently is something that um, this person called Table Talk. And it's a particularly good format, again, using a Zoom platform or something like that, um, to position especially elders uh, in your friendship or family or both network um, with, with some folks that come to listen to them tell stories and to ask questions. 
these are stories that die with our friends and family. And to have the privilege of time to hear those and to use the format that way, it does take some reaching out, but we're all up to that. We can do that. One uh, final thing that I'll mention, Gary and I have had the opportunity to um, connect again with a friend of Gary's from for a couple of decades, Sister Helen Prejean, who wrote Dead Man Walking. Um, and in that connection, we've learned of some more work that she's doing um, relative to um, some new writing that she's done. And it, it really, the way that she's working with that, I've got it here on my phone, is um, with uh, journaling, encouraging people to use journals as a way of being with themselves. And I would say in particular for our purposes today and in December, in dark times. And I have this quote from her in this workbook that she's putting together for um, courses. You ought to check her out. Um, she says, simply by jotting a few words on a page, we make our inward thoughts visible, which can help us clarify what's darkly circling around inside. She goes on to say, write and write and write in a way that you know nobody else has to see it. And do not resist writing down what you find most mm, worthy of resistance, most horrific or awful or I really don't want to write this down. Write it down and, and consistent with what we've heard from wise people for a long time. Pay attention to that. Just listen to it. You don't have to pay hard attention, but listen to it. Hold it. What is that there to teach you? What do you pop at? And what does that have to teach you? Um, I've one, We've heard several people say, that's your guru. Bow down to that, that you resist the most. Well, we tend to resist the darkness. What can we learn from that guru? Yeah, I think you can definitely, I agree with Mary, write your way into uh, the revelation of, the, of that guru, of that, of that wall, of that anger, or whatever's going on, um, in a way that you don't always have conscious um, knowledge of it uh, or awareness of it until you start spinning out the lines that... that shine the light inward again no need to show it to anybody in fact you know don't but um it will i think surprise you if you stay with it how um powerful it can be and the darkness itself shows the light you know how the moon changes every month um there is this shadow that we science tells us is the umbra but between the shadow the darkness and the light that is reflecting is a space that is the penumbra, the liminal space between light and dark. And, and that's, that's where we always are because in this hemisphere, um, at least as far down as we are, not if we were in Barrow, right? Mm, true. Or no. Yes. Um, but we have the sun. We have the space between the dawn and the dusk. And so here we are at solstice time with still light, but we've got more evidence of the shadow, of the space between. And that's where, even in the, the full darkness, you see light, whatever light there is, you see it better. And so that's an invitation back to something that Gary and I really have worked to develop in the full ecology um, work, and that is to notice, it's much easier in the natural world, but we can do it in our own lives, what's working? Our neurons are myelinating. The breath is coming in and out. For now, there are things that are working. Indeed. Lots and lots and lots of things. Some things we don't even know about yet uh, are, are working. And the collective working is really profound and mysterious and remarkable. Not just these isolated things working, because that's not how life ever works, but this community, this, this planet-wide and beyond uh, community of, of, of health and vitality and uh, the energy that keeps the wheel of life turning. Yeah, health and vitality and sickness and death and caring and just moving it all forward, all together in this fabulous, incomprehensible concert. 
Yes, and so here we are, talking with you in the middle of that as you are living your life in the middle of and as an expression of the fullness of ecology, really. Yeah. So we're going to um, take this a little deeper like we do on the, well, not the first Thursday. It's going to be the, no, first Tuesday. It's going to be the 10th. Nope, take it back, the 8th. The 8th is the first Tuesday, we or we're going to call it the first Tuesday, because today would be the first Tuesday, right? So we're going to do the deep dive, uh, and we will send out a reminder to our newsletter list, um, and we'll, we'll take this further and really look close at what happens with human sensibility during the darkness um, from a physiological standpoint and what else is happening in the natural world in the dark that can help us uh, as we navigate this actual and metaphorical darkness um, that we're faced with right now. So that will be the 8th. We start at 6 o'clock Mountain Time. And then on uh, Thursday the 10th and Thursday the 20th, will it be the 24th? That'd be ridiculous. Could do. Mm. Wow. Yeah, maybe just Thursday the 10th this month. <laughs> I hadn't done that math. We will do a meditation and inquiry time. Um, again, at 6 o'clock. And there'll be a little notice out for that. So, if you're not on our uh, subscription list, please go to www.fullecology.com. Scroll to the bottom. And you can sign on, for no cost, of course, to our um, communications would love to have you join us and um, hopefully we'll get a chance to be in conversation, hear your thoughts and uh, concerns and hopes uh, when we talk on the deep dive on uh, the 8th. Gosh, you'd think I would have that by now. Yeah, the 8th is Gary's half birthday. That's right. And it's birthday. my daughter's birthday. I'm telling you, it's so a good day. It's a it's great day a to day. deep dive. Come celebrate with yeah. us. All right. All right. Well, thanks for spending this time with us and yeah. be safe and be well and... Um, we look forward to staying in touch. Take really good care of yourself and one another.